While the world's eyes are focused on ISIS and rising tensions in the Middle East, a former terrorist group from Iran is tromping through the halls of Congress and garnering support from some of America's most powerful and prominent politicians and officials. Howard Dean, Ed Rendell, Patrick Kennedy, and many others. The group is the People's Mujahideen of Iran, or the MEK in its Persian acronym. It was taken off the State Department's foreign terrorist organization list two years ago after demonstrating that it had not been engaged in terrorist activities for the last 10 years. The group is led by Masoud Rajavi, who has been in hiding since 2003 when the United States and Britain invaded Iraq, and Maryam Rajavi, who acts as the president-elect for the National Council of Resistance of Iran, the group's political wing. According to the FBI, the MEK murdered American citizens in Iran during the 1970s, allied with the Ayatollahs to help overthrow the Iranian government, participated in the American embassy hostage crisis in 1979, and teamed up with Saddam Hussein to fight its own countrymen during the Iran-Iraq war. They are responsible for the deaths of thousands of Iranians through a campaign of bombings, assassinations, and military attacks, as well as collusion with Iraq. The goal of the group now is to overthrow the current Iranian regime and take power for themselves. So how does a group go from being one of the most dangerous terrorist organizations in the world to having an office on Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C., with backing from the likes of the former U.S. Ambassador to the U.N., John Bolton, and former Director of Homeland Security, Tom Ridge, among many others. There's been a lot of pressure in the United States, um, both from the group and from its supporters in Congress and very high-paid former officials speaking on their behalf, to delist the group. In 2011, groups around the country acting as front organizations for the MEK, including the Iranian American Community of Northern California, hired lobbyists to help remove the MEK from the foreign terrorist organization list. They recruited the likes of Howard Dean, who is the former Democratic presidential candidate, Michael Hayden, the former CIA director, and Newt Gingrich, who is the former Speaker of the House, and the lobbying firm Aiken, Gump, Strauss, Hauer, and Feld, among many others. They often paid five-figure speaker fees to individuals and six figures to the firms lobbying on their behalf. They're just thorough PR jobs that do a very good job of, of making kind of lawyer-like arguments based on taking uh, very nitpicky looks at wording. That's Jeremiah Gulka, the author of the mujahideen e hag in Iraq, a policy conundrum, which is a report published by the RAND Corporation in 2009 that assesses the status of the MEK at a camp called Ashraf in Iraq. I was uh, asked to take the charge of this particular project to figure out who, who are the mujahideen e hag, um, why are they there in Iraq, what should the Detainee Operations Command do, if anything? However, following the publication, the RAND report came under fire by the MEK and its paid lobbyists in Washington. Well, I'm a, a former policy official, and one of my roles is as a consultant to a law firm in Washington. Um, an American citizens group hired the law firm to help them advocate to remove the MEK from the terrorism list. That's Ambassador Lincoln P. Bloomfield, the former Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs from 1992 to 1993. He wrote a book entitled The Mujahideen Haq, MEK, Shackled by a Twisted History, that posits that the MEK has been severely misunderstood over time. I found out that there's a gap between what everyone was saying about the MEK and what the information seemed to show, that there was a gap. Something was amiss. So that really piqued my curiosity, and I just kept on digging for the next two years. Ambassador Bloomfield's law firm, Aiken, Gump, Strauss, Hauer, and Feld, was reportedly paid $620,000 by a group supportive of the MEK during those two years, according to the Senate Office of Public Records. But are his claims, which match those of the MEK, true? So as I began to examine what think tanks were saying, what the press was saying, a very consistent set of allegations arose that they killed Americans in the 1970s in Iran, that they had helped with the embassy 
hostage takeover during the revolution in 1979, that they were a violent left-wing Marxist group um, that was speaking about democracy but didn't really mean it, and that they'd engaged in a whole series of violent actions and were also uh, human rights abusers in their own midst. In June 1973, Lieutenant Colonel Lewis Hawkins of the U.S. Army was the first American assassinated by the MEK as he walked near his home in Tehran, Iran, according to the Associated Press. Ambassador Bloomfield claims that Hawkins was murdered by a man named Vahid Afrate, citing two articles from 1976 in the Washington Post. This is significant because the MEK narrative has attempted to gain credibility in the United States by separating itself from the killing of Americans. Other activists who were impatient with the MEK took the Mujahideen name and said, and weren't interested in Islam, and they, they wanted a secular, Marxist, violent revolution, and they were the ones who killed the Americans. They were caught. I have put the Washington Post articles from those days uh, in my report. The Washington Post articles are referenced as proof that a U.S. State Department report on the MEK is problematic and possibly untrue because it says Reza Rezai, not Afrate, was arrested and executed by the Shah's government for the murder of Colonel Hawkins. The MEK and its supporters are trying to separate Rezai from the killing of Colonel Hawkins because even though he is dead, he is still idolized by the current MEK as a hero. However, while it may be true that Afra Te committed the actual murder of Colonel Hawkins, two separate reports from the Associated Press in 1973, obtained by Mint Press News, named Reza Rezai as the man alleged to have planned the murder of Colonel Hawkins and as the leader of the group. One of the reports says, the gunman who killed Hawkins is still at large. That person who was still at large very well could have been Afra Te. So the fact that he is named as the actual gunman does not in any way absolve Razai from responsibility for the murder, nor does it contradict the State Department report. The MEK also claims, as does Ambassador Bloomfield, that it is separated from the murder of the seven Americans, including Colonel Hawkins, because there was a schism in the group between a Marxist-leaning faction and the Muslim faction led by Masood Rajavi. There was blood between the two factions. The one that wanted Islam is the one that we see today. Uh, and for their, for their commitment to Islam, uh, a couple of people were gunned down by these leftist revolutionaries who were using the name Mujahideen. However, that schism did not happen until 1975. Therefore, in the words of Mohammed Sahami, Hawking's assassination, at least, was irrefutably the work of the original MEK. Another problem with the narrative of the MEK not being involved with the killings of Americans is that the group bragged about those murders in its very own newspaper called Mojahid, seen here. The text states, it was the Mujahideen Khalq that killed with guns American generals and also blew up nests of spies, like America's information office. The MEK and its supporters also claim that the group was not involved with the U.S. Embassy hostage crisis and that it did not support it in any way. This one is, is very black and white and it is misunderstood and frankly allegations that the MEK were behind the embassy takeover and were promoting uh, keeping the Americans hostage only uh, surfaced in detail a few years ago. The problem with this statement is that the MEK clearly promoted the 1979 embassy takeover in its newspaper. The headline to the article in this issue of Mojahid says, we are happy that this time they targeted the real Shah, which is America's imperialism. The nest of the spies has been seized. Further, despite an intense campaign to expunge the MEK's troubled history toward the safety and well-being of American citizens and the way it treats its own members, the State Department, the FBI, Human Rights Watch, and the RAND Corporation have not changed their stance on any of these issues. So what is the MEK? The aforementioned organizations claim that not only is it an opposition group to the current Iranian regime, but it is a kind of cult. At the MEK camps, uh, 
it's a whole set of, of practices that are all textbook out of, out of cult theory. Sleep deprivation, uh, make work projects, uh, which is one of the reasons why uh, Camp Ashraf has all this surprisingly, it's pretty, I mean, there are all these beautification projects there. There's fountains and there's gardens and there are all of these statues and memorials to things. Make work projects. Uh, sometimes food limitation. But one of the big things that's a, to know about them is the, the stuff that gets at people, like um, forced celibacy, forced divorce, uh, gender segregation. The, they will claim that the divorce was not forced, that uh, one of their representatives told me that, uh, I don't remember his exact words, but that in the desert, it just doesn't support family life. And I'm, I'm sure that Iraqi families feel that just the same way. Masoud Bani Sadr was an MEK member for 20 years and served as the group's representative to the United Nations and the United States during that time. He now ardently denounces the group. His account of what it's like on the inside supports Gulka's claims. And not only me, all members were forced to divorce their uh, spouses and uh, later they had to uh, send their children abroad to Europe and United States to be adopted by supporters and other members. The final stage was uh, self-divorce meant that uh, you have to divorce your own personality, your own individuality. You have to prove to the group that uh, your whole uh, individuality and personality before you become member of the group were uh, devilish and wrong and um, corrupt and so on. The MEK and its supporters claim that the group is not a cult though and that former members have been coerced into saying that it is a cult by Iran's intelligence services. This, this is what's important to remember. Even if the, there are Iranian efforts to paint you know, the MEK as terrible, which there are. I mean, the MEK, I'm mean, sorry, the Iranian regime is always trying to make the MEK look terrible. But it's easy to make the MEK look terrible because the MEK looks terrible. Part of Gulka's job in Iraq when assessing the MEK camp was to interview members of the group. I mean, I interviewed loads of people, and I mean, were they all like agents? I, I you know, I doubt it. Were were was the Iranian agents? Were they sneaking into the to the re locked off refugee camp off of Fob Grizzly and planting information to somehow feed me when they did not know I was coming? In response to the MEK's claims, Human Rights Watch even went back and reassessed their reporting, and re-interviewed the original people from their report. The second time around, they made the same claims that the organization is a cult and that they were tortured and abused by MEK's leaders. Human Rights Watch found no evidence of influence by Iranian intelligence services. Despite the documented history behind the group's nefarious claims, it still came off the terrorism list. And that's because the single most important thing it did was end all acts of violence. And on this point, both Gulka and Ambassador Bloomfield agree. In September of 2012, when Secretary of State Clinton removed the MEK from the U.S. terrorism list, the announcement said that the MEK had conducted no acts of violence for at least 10 years. I, I actually was thinking they should come off the list. And I think that the U.S., I don't think the U.S. made the decision for the right reasons, but I think they made the right decision. I think the U.S., ne I think they needed to come off the list because I think the list as written that this statute has written, they no longer uh, really satisfied. And I think it's important that there be some kind of incentive to terrorist groups in the world to say, um, you know, if you stop being violent, we will take you off the list. So now that the MEK is no longer officially considered a terrorist group, what is it? How are they any different from other Iranian opposition groups, such as the National Front, or supporters of the previous monarchy? This is the problem which they are facing. Uh, I mean, the kind of questions that they face from uh, ordinary Iranian outside of Iran or uh, their supporters outside of Iran is that, uh, how do you want to go back to Iran? How do you want to overthrow this government? The only answer which they have is that uh, we are lobbying 
United States. We are lobbying uh, Euro uh, Western countries uh, to fight against the Iranian government. First, to put sanction, put uh, hardship on Iranian government so they cannot solve the problem of Iranian people. And this might create uh, some um, uh, resistance and opposition within Iran and uh, create uh, an environment of uh, revolution, perhaps, inside of Iran. At the same time, we are inviting Western countries, especially United States, to attack Iran because of uh, nuclear issue, because of Israel issue, and so on. So when United States attacks Iran, the only people uh, that can govern the country are us. There is nobody else. Guka agrees with Bani Sadr's assessment of the group. He echoed his remarks about the MEK trying to grab power in Iran through pressuring the American government. But from a perspective rooted in the shame behind the horrors of America's invasion of Iraq in 2003. Everywhere always trying to make it sound like Iran is so super powerful as a military force. And it's nothing compared to Israel which is nothing compared to us, yet we're going to get ourselves up into a lather. We're the only, the only end result of that, the only logical end result if you let it keep going, is that we get violent with Iran. And that doesn't suit anybody's interests without even ask, questioning the actual morality of it. I mean, do I support the Iranian regime? No. But when you look at what we did to Iraq, where where now people in the, mili in the, in the media constantly talk about 100,000 civilians dying, as if that's something we should accept. And, and most evidence suggests that's like one-tenth of the people who actually died. And that's death. That's not the number of people who are just displaced or injured or had their lives ruined. And the millions of people who were displaced and had to leave the country or just displaced within Iraq. I mean, we wrecked that country. Because some people here wanted to do it, and you had you know, fools like, like Ahmed Shalabi saying that they could go and take over the place, and our fools who followed it. And the number of deaths for our people, too, and the way we've ruined lives here, and the way we've, you know, the money we've spent on it. Why would we repeat that in Iran? I mean, it's insane. But of course, insanity is the whole notion, you know, doing it, you know, thinking you can do it again, right, this time. And, and it's just, it's just frightening to watch us go down that path if we keep listening to the MEK. For Mint Press News in Washington, this is Sean Nevins.